So I couldn't key out to save my life when I was a kid, right? Not many kids can. No. Let's be honest. But, but I'd go, boosh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so this was me out in the driveway in Havelock, boosh, <laughs> right? I can't make this up. <laughs> So, uh, so my young, my 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 earliest memories of my my nickname was uh, Joe Mosh. <laughs> there you go. That's there it is. I said it. I said it. I can't take it back. <laughs> the whole world's gonna know it now. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to the Okinawa Karate Podcast. I am Josh Simmers, coming to you from the birthplace of karate, Okinawa, Japan. I find myself in Udama city today out near Camp Courtney Marine Corps Base and I am of course sitting here next to a Marine uh, Fulberg Colonel Marine Corps uh, Colonel Jason Perry. Jeff, Sir, how are you? Thank you so Good much. See you. For, uh, this is great. I appreciate you inviting yeah, me out. I've, I've enjoyed your podcast. We've been talking about doing this for a while. We have. And that's right. uh, before we go any further we have to give a big shout out to the gentleman that's letting us use his dojo yeah. for this. Mike Giesek, he's a good friend of mine. His dojo is right here in Uruma. He's a way to you. I, I love about being in Okinawa is he's just too cocky. You know? yeah. And uh, and Mike's been Mike's been great. He's not only a good friend, but he's an incredible karateka. Um, I uh, you know, he, he's he's a way to you guy. He trains in uh, in Nago with the way to family. He has been around for a long time. We do weapons together, mm -hmm. and so that's my offering here, and uh, and I get to come and, and use the dojo every once in a while, and uh, and use his, his makiwara. And occasionally, while we're doing weapons, we'll do a little kote kitai, although uh, I can only handle about ten minutes with him, and he, he just brutalizes <laughs> me. So, but uh, yeah, great friend and uh, uh, a wonderful dojo. It great is a wonderful dojo. dojo. I yeah. mean, perfect size, probably uh, it's very Okinawa. fifteen or twenty tatami size. Yeah, on probably. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that translates to. To uh, an American measurement, uh, 20 by 30 or something like that. Yeah. Maybe. Not too big. Not, Not too, too big. Small. And I think if you had um, 10 students in here, it'd be it'd be full. Yeah, yeah you'd probably be rotating a little bit. Yep. You know? But yep. that is pretty much the, the typical size that you see for yeah. Okinawa, right? right? When you came down to Kina Sensei's dojo that time with us, it was even a little bit smaller than this, house, right? right? Yeah, 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 it was. And that's, Filled it pretty quick. <laughs> that's, uh, that's normal pretty much for Okinawa. But, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're sitting down to do the formal interview after we've done some kata, which I like. Hey, I like. And actually, this is uh, probably the first time I've done this in over a year where I got to get together with somebody, sit down uh, after doing kata. Right. Uh, you and I have done kata prior uh, mm -hmm. one other time. So I'll give a, a little bit of a hundred times, story. as a matter of fact. hundred <laughs> times. That's right. That's right. So, <laughs> but we, so, so, so we, did, we, we, uh, we did the 100 kata challenge That's one right. year ago. That's right. 2019 um, yeah. down in Naha. Yeah. And uh, we had a lot of fun with that. It got dark, so we didn't get it mm -hmm. done. Me and you and Andy Sloan doing yeah, that. Three that. different versions of Nahachi show on together. Shodan Ryu, Okinawa Kempo, and uh, Ishin Ryu, Ryu right. Naihanshi Shodan, which was fun. Right. And then it got dark, so we didn't get it film right. anymore, but we did the 100 kata. We sure did. Uh, but yeah, I think I may have told you this. I'm not sure. I want to give a little bit of the backstory about uh, meeting you. Um, because I, you know, I, I started in Okinawa Kempo in North Carolina. In North Carolina. Carolina. Uh, man Good. named uh, Vic Coffin. Good friend of mine. Yep. Yeah. And when he found out that you were coming here, mm -hmm. uh, coming back to Okinawa for a rotation with the Marine Corps, he had, he had said, you need to find this guy. Yeah. Um, Jason Perry, he's, he's a great guy, you know, right. and he speaks extremely highly of your father. Um, so I said, okay, well, I want to do that, but I didn't really, you know, yeah, how do you go about how, that? How do right? you go about that? Yeah, sure. So one year ago, I met mm -hmm. Sensei Ron Nix's dojo with uh, Sensei That's Patrick right. Hale. That's right. Yep, because every yeah. October, Sensei uh -huh. Pat McGill comes to Okinawa. Right. And we always go and visit Sensei Nicks. Yeah. And uh, here you come walking up. And I was That's like, right. well, how about that? So one year ago, uh, I think it was last month, right? October yeah. uh, is when we had met. And, and Ryan Sensei met, right? wore us out. He smoked us. I had to, I crawled out of the dojo <laughs> that night. He smoked us. Yeah. Uh, which he's <laughs> done. I've been there three times, and I think he's think done he, that pretty much every time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> kind of. I like to think he does it especially for us, but I have a feeling that's just the way he trains. It is the way he trains. Yeah. I watch him online all the time. Uh, he, With his son. Uh, his yeah, son, Brandon, right. and some of their, their 
top students, they're senior students there, they're all yeah. top students, and Absolutely. they're going hard all they the are. time. They so are, that's right. It, it, I'd like to say it's a special treatment, but it's, it's normal. <laughs> nope. Yeah, and then we, you came down to Kino Sensei's dojo. I did, yeah. What was that, the beginning of? Right no, it's when COVID been, started. Right right right. Still the end of 2019, the early been. part of early uh, part of, yeah. That's right. 2020, yeah. Before, mm-hmm. before we even knew about COVID. Um, That's right. And we trained down there that, that and night. What a time. cool place. First of all, it's right, I didn't realize, it's, it's right beside the Shihangako. Yep. Where Yabu Kensu and yep. all those guys used to yep. talk, where really it all started. And uh, and then, wow, what a place. It's awesome. Yeah. I love it. And it's there he's sitting great. over in the, in the corner, you know, yep. watching us. And His wife with the, with the little oh, treats. I mean, just, yeah, it really is. It just so special going down there to yeah. see her and always giving the other treats out at the mm-hmm. end of the class, you know. But and we earned it. We we earned Absolutely. it every time. So all right, well, I'd like to do the formal interview. Okay. Since we did the formal training. Yep. Sounds good. It's rather informal training, which is the way I like it. Yes. Actually. But yeah. let's go ahead and get started. Let's okay. hear about your background and your upbringing and what brought you into the martial arts. Yeah. What brought me into the martial arts? I mean that's such a hard thing to say because I don't have any like recollection of starting karate. I think most people, they probably remember the day they went to the dojo and met their teacher and, you know, took their first class or whatever. I, I, uh, I don't, I don't really have any of those memories. You know, karate was just something I grew up with. It just, we just, I don't, I don't it was such a natural part of, of growing up. Um, I, I listened to, uh, uh, actually Pat McGilson says, uh, interview and a lot of the things he talked about, you know, as young as he started, and I kind of related to that very much, you know, but, um, so my teacher is my father, and, uh, when I was born, he was actually in Vietnam at the time, but he was already, had already started to study Ishin Yu at the time, uh, having met some, some Ishin Yu people in, in South Carolina, actually, when he first joined the Marine Corps, and he had boxed to, since he was very young, but then, um, but then he was introduced to, to karate, Okinawan karate, when he was in, uh, in the Marine Corps. And then subsequently on the way to Vietnam, had come here. Actually, his first dojo was right up the road again. Just really? Right, up, right, yeah, it's right up the road here from, from where we are right now. Was he, was his first dojo with uh, Jim Wooker? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Jim Jim Wooker, Wooker, Tom 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 Correct. So he was stationed at a place called Camp Hague at the time. So, um, and a lot of fellow listeners, unless you've lived in Okinawa or are familiar with the area, you won't know it, but Nobori Kawa, where the JA mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. the, the, the uh, Champuru no Ichiba, across the street, right where were the Kentucky Fried Chicken and the McDonald's and down to the Okinawa Kita exit yes. onto the freeway now, that whole area on this side of the, on the inland side of the, uh, on this side of the, the, the highway, the road, that was all a U.S. base. And that's where my dad was stationed. Oh, okay. It's called Camp Hague. Now it's called like Nobui Kawa area. Okay. Um, did Courtney is part of Courtney? What was part of that base at one I time? I think they were two. Were, I I don't know for sure, but I think they were two separate facilities. Yeah. But there were many more. There were there were more bases. There more bases then, back then than there are now. Yeah. And so hard to believe, right? Hard to believe, Just, right? Yeah. And probably between Camp Hague and and the Agina Dojo, which is right, it, it's right down the road this way at the. Um, at the uh, uh, agricultural high school, right, right there is the area it was in. Yeah. Andy Sloan could, I'm yeah. sure, give you the ten-digit grid to it. But uh, so, so Dad would walk through the cane, sugar cane fields and you know what is now a completely built-up area, but, and and train. But that was in in and out of Okinawa. It was in, on a, on the way to uh, to Vietnam. So it wasn't consistent. It wasn't. It was it was you know pay your dollar, go to the dojo, train, and. Uh, and and then you know between between uh, you know, visits in and out to, to Vietnam, so right. so that's kind of how Dad got his start. And then and then you know I was born. Dad came home from Okinawa, and I just I, it was just something we always did. It was you know throw a punch or here do your do your blocks, and so I really don't have much of a recollection of, of doing karate as a young kid. It wasn't in a dojo that I recall um, until I was a little older, and um, and we were stationed in. in uh, in Cherry Point, okay, and and that's when uh, my dad met met a gentleman named Bill Hayes, and Hayes Sensei had been stationed at Camp Hansen about that same time, and um, 
And so, in haste since they started their dojo in an abandoned building in Cherry Point. And it was just a bunch of Marines. Uh, kids didn't do karate. I think the first time I saw a kid in the dojo was, you know, probably not until the 80s. And of course, this was like 74, five time frame, I guess. And, um, and I, was, I was very young, you know, six, seven years old, I guess. Those are my first recollections in, in that, in Hayes Sensei's dojo in Cherry Point, in this old abandoned building. Those are my first you know, memories of, of actually going to a dojo, uh, putting on a gi, training in a class, and, um, you know, it was mainly me. We'd warm up, and then I'd go over in the corner, and Dad would have me walk up and down the dojo a thousand times doing, you know, Chudanuke or Joranuke or Oizuki or something like that. And, uh, and he'd forget me over in the corner, and an hour and a half later, you know, he'd say, all right, line up, time to go home. <laughs> so so that's, those are my, my good memories. Good class, son. Yeah, good class. Well, well done. <laughs> but um, all Marines, you know, and, and, uh, and a great group. And it wasn't a dojo necessarily of, of people doing a certain kind of karate. We had a kung fu guy in there. There was a taekwondo guy in there. There was, uh, my dad had done Ishin Yu, but he began to, to learn shorting you, and that kind of began his his transition to shorting you uh, with Hayes Sensei. And uh, of course, Hayes Sensei had trained here with Eizo Shimabuku Sensei, Tatsu's brother. And um, and so, yeah, that was that was uh, that was my those are my beginnings, I guess. The, that, that's I, I just remember over and over kata, and we do kumite in the in the afternoons and, and, and the, on, on Thursdays, I guess. And, do you remember what kata you would have been doing at that time if oh, it was yeah. such an, a mixture? Oh, yeah. My hands go. Yeah. I was a white belt. I was a I was a, <laughs> no well, question. I, yeah. I, I was a white belt for nine years, yeah. right? Uh, I, I, I don't... So I never tested for any rank. I, I never had a, much of a consciousness of rank, right? So go to the dojo... Literally, it was, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. Maybe I am exaggerating just because my, in my youth, I, this is how I remembered it. It might not have been as bad as I remember, but, you know, literally just going up and down the dojo, stances, walking, blocks, punches, and then Naihanchi Kata. And I remember starting to learn Naihanchi Sana, right? And Dad pulled me over the side. I was like, I knew Naihanchi Shodan now. I knew Naihanchi Sana now. And Dad walks me over the corner, and he, he shows me the first move. And you kind of lean up. And Put your hand up like this. It's this, this kind of chew on the kid posture like this. And he goes, okay. He fixes my legs a little bit and tells me to lean a little bit further this way and bend my knee and straighten this leg and turn my heel and turn my hips in a little bit more. And you know, and then he walks away. And I don't know. In my mind, it must have been forty-five minutes. Yeah. It was probably it could have been five minutes. I don't know. But he just walked away. He said, That's good. And he left, and I stood there just like that. And he went over and did something. I don't know what. But I stood there, and then he he started saying, right, "Just get hey." Good job. That's the first technique, and uh, and we went and lined up, and you know did our push-ups or whatever we do, and uh, and and that was the class. Yep. So yeah, Naihanchi, a lot of Naihanchi kata, and then you know I was it was uh, we were actually at Larson Gym in Quantico, Virginia, and we lined up one day. Uh, I was probably ten by that time. I'd been a white belt for I was probably eleven by that time. I'd been a white belt for you know nine or so years, and eight years, and, and Dad brought me up to the front. Uh, a a Wei Yu guy named John Korea, another okay. Marine who was training with my dad at the time, very good friend, uh, remains a good friend, and uh, and he um, he put a green obi on me, and I got back in line and we trained, and that was it. There was no testing, there was nothing like that. We just there was no yellow belt or blue belt or whatever. It was just one day you walked in the dojo, put a green belt on you, and go back to training. So you got promoted. This is uh, you got promoted. Your dad was your main sensei. My still, only still is, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. But you, you had essentially your promotion. Your obi was given to you from an OHRU sensei. Yeah, my brown obi was given to me by a guy, by a guy named John Pachivas. My dad would, my dad was my only teacher, and I never had a teacher than my father until I became an adult, and then I've done some other things. But, um, but dad always found other people. So John Korea was actually a student of Wei Kindly sensei. Okay. And he had trained at the Futenma Dojo in Okinawa, had recently returned from Okinawa to Quantico. My dad had a, a dojo at, at the Quantico Larson Gym. It's, 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 I think it's torn down now. It's gone. 
And, uh, and so when it was time for me to be promoted, instead of him putting the OB on me, Dad had Korea Sensei um, come up and put the OB on me and tell me to go back in line. What do you think the reason was for that? Is there a significance to that? Uh, I don't. Your dad showing respect to Korea Sensei? Was he, was one of them yeah. senior? I, no, I mean, I think Dad was senior. I mean, Dad was senior in prob probably in karate, but definitely in the Marine Corps. Um, and, and, and they became lifelong friends from there. I don't know if there's some deeper hidden meaning there. Dad was just like, I don't know. Korea Sensei didn't put that in yeah. place. You know? I, I don't know. Although, you know, there probably is a little bit of, no, I'm his teacher, but I don't own the product. You know, the, the product is, is is everybody's input. And maybe he wanted to share that a little bit with, yeah. with the people that I had trained with. Because, you know, growing up, I mean, I trained with Club, I trained with Wookie, I trained with Dad, I trained with Hey Sensei. Everybody had a nickname back then. And uh, what was yours? Joe Mush. <laughs> Joe Mush. Joe Mush. <laughs> so I couldn't key out to save my life when I was a kid, right? Not many kids can. No. Let's be honest. But but I'd go, Moosh! <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so this was me out in the driveway in Havelock. Moosh! <laughs> right? I can't make this up. <laughs> so uh, so my young my 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 earliest memories of my my nickname was uh, Joe Moosh. <laughs> there you go. That's there it is. I've said it, I've said it, I can't take it back. <laughs> can't the take whole world's gonna know it now. Yeah. <laughs> I hope your dad listens to this. <laughs> yeah, well, you will. <laughs> That's fantastic. Wow. Okay. So at that time, when you, your father was had already transitioned from Wage to do somewhat into Shodan Ryu. Ishin Ryu to Shodan Ryu. Ishin Ryu. That's right. Ishin Ryu into uh, Shodan mm -hmm. Ryu. So your kata and your foundation of Okinawa karate was Shodan Ryu from the beginning. From the beginning. Correct. So about this time, my father eventually got orders back to Okinawa. We didn't go with him. We stayed in Quantico, in uh, Havelock, I think. We were in Havelock, Cherry Point. And Dad came out here, and he was stationed at Futenma, you know, right down the road a ways. And just outside the gate, uh, Shiroma Jiro-sensei, who was a student of Nakazato Shuguro-sensei, had, had a dojo. So this was Shodan Yu, Shodan Kan. Shodan Yu, Shodan Kan. That's right. And I think Dad would like to it because he had been training with Hei Sensei, uh, Shimabuku Sensei, who I later trained with, actually. We'll, be, we'll have to talk about yeah. that. But, but I later had the opportunity to train with Shimabuku Eizo Sensei in his dojo up in Ginoza. And I think it, Dad, Dad had... I think Hei Sensei, what Hei Sensei offered to my dad was a little bit more structure than he had had in his karate training up mm -hmm. until that point. And they were very good friends, and um, and I think Dad would have it would have enjoyed going up there, but it's it's a long way yeah, from Futenma. And I think back there was then, no was, express. There was no express. Way. That's right. And so you're in your island beater trying to get up to King or Ginoza to go to the dojo, and and Dad learned about Sh uh, Shiroma Sensei, and Shiroma Sensei was also I think appealed to Dad because he was a bit of a fighter. He didn't focus too much on kata as much as uh, some of the other folks and and so um, uh, dad found the Shiroma's dojo right outside of, of Futenma and and began training there and that's where dad really um, so this was mid 70s uh, really became more acquainted with Shorin Yu Shorin Kan Nakazato Sensei's uh, organization okay and and what what time what year Years with this was this also during the Vietnam 74 75? So, so it was Vietnam. the tail end. Dad was actually involved um, in in the evacuation um, of, of Saigon. Not, I don't think he was in country, he was involved in it back here with some of the movement of personnel oh, okay. and uh, things like that. They, they, they had a provisional uh, uh, mad marine air, marine amphibious group, something like that, marine amphibious unit. Um, that they formed in order to facilitate the evacuation. Dad was involved in that in, in some way. And, um, and so he was there during that. He was here here in Okinawa during that time. Okay. okay. So for his time in Okinawa then, that would have been a 
I'm assuming, time that he got to spend the, the most time probably in an actual dojo. Correct. <clears throat> That's right. Now, when he came back from Okinawa, what what did you see? Can you rec have any recollection of what you saw differently in your father's yeah. karate at that time or what he may have taught you or how things changed for you? Yeah. That's, it. that's tough to say. So we moved back to Quantico, and that's kind of where um, Dad really began to teach and, and have students of his own. You know, I think at that point he had, he had studied karate, he had done karate for a long time, but even back then, I think even in Okinawa, there wasn't as much structure as there is now, right? It was, oh, you're going to tournament here, put this black belt yeah. on, and we hear this a lot. Right? You hear it a lot, right, from, the, from older guys, and it was much less structure then. And so, and that's the, that's the environment that dad, I think, came up in. So it was a little bit here, a little bit there. It was training with a number of different people who just liked martial arts. Or, you know, mm -hmm. seen, um, had, had a little, dabbled in it a little bit and, and trained together. But then coming back, I think from Shiroma Sensei, his time in Okinawa, um, he, he actually started to teach more formally. Um, and or we moved to Quantico, Virginia, where he had a dojo there on base with a bunch of Marines, um, and then ultimately retired in 81, so only you know, five, six years after he got home. He retired from the Marine Corps, and while he did other work uh, out in town in, in Hendersonville, North Carolina, where we live now, uh, he, he actually opened a dojo. Okay. It was like, that was the first time when somebody, I saw somebody like pay money to, to train. This is really weird. Yeah. He's going to pay money to come at the YMCA. Yeah. They're going to pay monthly dues and do, to do karate, huh? Yeah, you would not see I had before. never, yeah, it just was so foreign to what, me. How old were you at this time, Brian? I was 11, 10, 10, 10, 11, 11. He was 12 when I retired. When your father, or when he retired, I was 12. When your dad came here, but you all stayed back in the States, correct? did you train under anyone, or was that no. a break time? Was yeah, I think it was just a break time for me. Because I wanted to ask you that, you know, growing up, yeah. with your father as your sensei, uh -huh. was there times in your life where you needed a break, you took a break, you asked dad for a break? I think they were natural breaks, like when dad was deployed, you know, when he was sent overseas, or um, at one point dad lived in Cherry Point, we lived in High Point, he thought he was going to retire. I didn't train much then, except when he came home on the weekends, and then we would train on the weekends together, just one on one. And um, uh, so it was. So my experience was, other than a few these few times, Hey Sensei's Dojo, Quantico, my experience was somewhat unstructured as well. It was just whenever Dad and I would go out in the garage or go out in the front yard and train. Now, did he become much more structured though when he started to teach in yes. the dojo? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because now it was people signing up for a regular class Tuesday and Thursday or whatever it was. And, you know, Tuesday nights, Kata night, Thursday nights, Kumite. And, and uh, it, was, it was much more um, regimented. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, learn weapons? I know you have a, a background in weapons mm -hmm. with as well. Was that something that your dad started in his, in his Ishinryu days? Or was that under something that maybe Hayes Sensei had incorporated? I'm not. Did Shimabu Kuro Hayes Sensei teach mm -hmm. Kuro? Mm -hmm. Okay, he did. Okay. Sure did. So I believe, and I'd have to confirm this with Dad, but but I think Dad's earliest Kobudo experience was with mainly with Hayes Sensei. Okay. And um, you know some Saikata, some Bokate. I think he was exposed to some uh, weapons here when he lived in in uh, Okinawa with uh, Shioma Sensei. Mm -hmm. But then um, I think as, as dad, uh, um, Nakazato Sensei has, a, you know, his Kobudo system, if you will, his Kobudo curriculum. And so, um, you know, as, as, uh, as we went on and dad reconnected with Nakazato Sensei directly, uh, we of course adopted Nakazato Sensei's Kobudo curriculum. So you you were then introduced to weapons uh, after your dad had retired from the Marine Corps. What is it introduced to? I mean, I had I had handled Psy. I, I competed with Psy and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yeah, prior to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Okay. Limited, but yes. Did you have a, a, a 
favorite that you, you gravitated to at a young age? At a young age, I think, yeah, probably Chatanyara. Yeah? Mm hmm. Okay. Which was, it was a, it's a version of Chatanyara that, that Azo Sensei taught. It's not the version that starts out with one side and then you pull oh. the other side from there. It's, it's actually a, a version of the, of the kata, same name, but it's a different kata. Okay. Entirely different kata, but uh, it's a pretty kata. It's yeah. Nice. yeah. In my older age, I think I gravitated to the Ekru. I enjoyed Ekru a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So. Now, when your dad was teaching, he started out at a Y, a YMCA. Is that? So yeah, once he gra once he retired from the Marine Corps, we moved to Western North Carolina. I was twelve or so, and Dad started working, um, you know, a regular job. But then uh, shortly after we got there, we actually started training in a, at a community center with a Taekwondo guy. A really, really nice guy. It was great, but it was so different. And yeah, it was just such a different thing. And we, we, we were, I was young, I was not as aware, but I, I did have this perception that maybe we were a little bit disruptive. You know, we were focused on other things and Maybe our fighting style was a little different than theirs. And that's my perception. Disruptive. Yeah, I think. Uh, although, although I got to say, you know, I don't remember anything but, but a welcoming um, uh, sensei there. And, and, uh, but, but I think Dad wanted, you know, by that time, Dad was fairly, you know, accomplished in his own right. Uh, in karate, he, he was, um, uh, you know, ready to really start out on his own mm -hmm. and, and open a dojo. So he went to the YMCA and, and just opened a little dojo. And, you know, these mountain beasts, mountain boys, toughest, I mean, they came out of the woodworks and wanted to train with Dad. And, you know, Dad's five, six, but he could, he could hold his own with the best of them. And, uh, and I think they loved it. Yeah. And, and, it went, and he's, he's got students today who are at the YMCA with him. And, and uh, you know, I've known him since I was 12 years old. They're still a student. Interesting. So he kind of uh, kept going with that in, in the Henderson area and still there. And still there in Hendersonville, that's right. Hendersonville. Hendersonville, okay. Hendersonville. Not to be confused with Henderson, which is over in, in, in Raleigh. Over, yes, over Raleigh. right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, Hendersonville out in the mountains. We have had people come to our camps and said, hey, I'm in Henderson, but I ain't finding y'all. So Okay, you're in the wrong By several, yeah, several you're, hours. You're close, you know, man. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. See you in half a day. So... Yeah. Not to jump ahead, though. Sure. Um, you mentioned the camps, but we'll, we'll get to the camps. But okay. because there was your history, then started from birth, essentially. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, it's hard you, to say, you right? Don't remember the time, like you said, of joining the dojo. No. As I'm going here to join. It was no. just here I am. It's just train. Um, it was just yeah. It was just go out in the backyard and do some punches and blocks and kicks. And Dad had a little monkey water. Yeah, just stuff. When he became, when he started to teach in, in the um, in the Y or in the community mm -hmm. center, and things did started to get a little bit more formal. Uh, he was in the Shoten Ryu Shoten Khan system at that time, if you if I could yes. say that, system yes. at that time. Um, so then you also were in that system and mm -hmm. then adapted um, all of their kata, and still to this day, that's all I ever knew. That's, okay. that's right. Yeah, that's all I ever ever really knew. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, take me through your teenage years. Did you do anything besides mar uh, besides Okinawa karate, martial arts wise or sports wise? I mean, I did I did sports in like junior high school, um, a little bit track and soccer and stuff like that. But I, I think by the time I was in junior high, by then I was competing a lot in in tournaments around that area. We met you know Vic Coffin. Yeah. Um, and Larry Isaacs and Larry and, and Don Bohan and um, a, a, just a lot of people, a lot of Ishin Yu people, uh, Kenpo folks, um, Shorty Yu, just just good people, mostly former Marines, you know, that were just friends of dads and we and dad enjoyed competing. It was a lot of fun, but we were competing quite a bit. So uh, I think by that time, you know. Um, I was teaching at the dojo. By then, we had moved out of the YMCA. Dad started his own in, on his own, renting a place. And so, at some point, then, yeah, you decided to follow in your father's footsteps, right? I don't know if it was ever a decision. I, I, it, 
So kind of like I don't know like what starting, else I would have done. Like know? starting in the dojo wasn't a decision. Going in the Marine Corps wasn't a decision. Or... Well, now the Marine Corps, yeah. So I, so yeah, I guess you know the Marine Corps. I um, so I, I went on a mission first, right? So I went on a mission for my church. I graduated from high school, um, and uh, actually, okay. So one story, can I tell you? One yeah, story? absolutely. This is, so I'm, I'm in high school and I go, so dad was kind of his own independent dojo and he really wasn't plugged into the Shorting Khan Association in Okinawa necessarily. Okay. He was running a dojo, teaching Akazato Sensei's karate. Um, but, then, but then through a number of different you know, events, he, he, he became uh, reacquainted with uh, Nakazato Sensei directly, right? Mm -hmm. Here he had trained under Shiroma Sensei. And um, Nakazato Sensei had come to the United States, visited some other dojos he had in other parts of the country, and, and Dad becomes reacquainted. And um, and so I'm at one of these camps, and uh, there was a sensei named Gibu Sokumichi. Uh, I think Gibu Sensei was from Urasoya, and his son Makoto came with him. And Gibu Sensei was like a senior guy. And my dad's kind of a senior guy, and Makoto, Gibu Sensei's son, is about my age. Maybe he might be a couple years older than me, and, and then I'm, I'm my dad's oldest son. You know, so, so the the folks running this thing, the senior guys, thought it'd be fun to put, put you know, Makoto and I together in a room uh, in the hotel at this camp. And I couldn't speak a lick of Japanese, right? I could I could say dojo words. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was terrible. I can't and, believe that. Yeah, and Makoto Sensei bless his heart. I mean, he was he was great, and he had your standard Japanese English, Japanese school public school system English, which uh, which certainly got him further than my Japanese was getting me. But we couldn't say like a, nothing. Was a, we were completely it was all hand and arm signals and you know weird facial expressions. And, you know, it was kind of at that point I said, you know, if I'm going to do this, I kind of, I probably ought to learn language. And, and, and it, it, that event created this interest in me. So I graduated from high school, and I went to Brigham Young University. My freshman year, I'm like, well, I don't want to learn Japanese. So I enrolled in a Japanese class. And then, uh, you know, so Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. And, and, uh, and so I turned 19, and, and, and I submit my papers to go on a mission. And, uh, and so, and you know, you don't volunteer for where you go. Okay. You just get a letter that says, okay. you, you have been called to serve in the, whatever, South America, Europe, United States, whatever. Well, sure enough, I get the letter that says you're going to Japan. You got me too. So anyway, I came out here, and of course, you know, I mean, I'm living in teeny little towns in the middle of Japan. But and this was up in the main part of Japan. This mainland Japan, not, not, not Okinawa. Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Mainland Japan, full-time missionary, white shirt, tie, riding my bicycle all over that corpse of Japan. And um, so then a few years back, and you might remember this, on Kokusai Dori, we did the Guinness Book of World yes. Records group cut. Yes. Were you there? Yes, I was. You were there. I was there. I was there with Pat Sensei. You were there with Pat yeah. Sensei. Yeah. Well, you and I were on the same street. You remember this, fourth thousand some odd of us yeah there. yeah just over four thousand just that's yeah. right that got counted in the guinness book so that actually yeah. got counted that's or right 4200 or, or more yeah that exactly was so i'm standing there on on coke side doy this is what four five years ago maybe i can't remember four, what was. four years ago four years ago yeah, yeah. four october right. i think it was so so I'm standing there, and I'm, I'm standing beside another sensei named Gibo Gyu Sensei, and I'm, I'm attending this with his dojo. A wonderful, a wonderful teacher, if you know Gibo Sensei. I have not met him, but... You need, yeah, he's, he's, he's great. He does a lot of the seminars down at the, at the prefecture at the time. And I'm standing there, and I look across the street, and I said, Sensei, who's, who's that guy standing right there? Is this older gentleman? Not older gentleman, about my age, but... Um, and he had a red and white OB on... And, um, and I'm thinking to myself, man, that guy, somehow I've seen him somewhere before. And Gibo Sensei looks at me and says, that's Gibu Sokuichi's son, Makoto. It was my roommate from when I was in high school in 1985, six time frame. And there we were in whatever, 2015, 16, whatever 16, year that, year that was. Yeah. 
And I would ask, so I walked up to him. Of course, by now I speak, I speak Japanese. I walked up to him and I said, I said, Sensei, do you remember coming with your father to the United States back in like high school days? He goes, yeah. I said, um, do you remember having a gaijin, a foreign, foreign roommate? He says, yep, yeah, you know, it was Doug Perry's son. And I had my, I had my gi on and, and, you know, my obi's got my name on it. I said, I said, oh, yes, I this. Yeah. It's been a long time. <laughs> he goes, oh, you know, and so here we are standing there. But he was really the whole reason I, I kind of decided that I wanted to learn Japanese. Uh, you know, ended up coming to Japan on a mission um, and, then, and then going into college. And really college is where I think the Marine Corps became. And you choose yeah, that too. Okay. Yeah. Now one thing I, I learned this um, because I have friends that are uh, members of the Mormon Church, mm -hmm. um, and I have senseis that are members. Kempo. Of the I didn't realize this until I came here, but right. yeah. Kempo is. Oh. So when you came over here um, on your mission, you were uh -huh. you were not allowed to train. No. That, right? No. So I didn't know that. Um, right. But uh, Kian Sensei and some other people had told me that yeah, when they go on missions, uh, they're not allowed to, he, no. I think he told me that he was allowed to practice by himself, right? Um, but could not attend a, a no. dojo, couldn't. That's right. So it's very interesting. Your every waking hour is accounted for when you're on your mission. And then you come to Japan, which is not Okinawa, but it's pretty no. close. Yes. But you could not train Japanese martial arts. No. You were not allowed to. No, that's right. Um, I, I did my kata on my own, and then uh, every year the mission would get together and we'd do our Christmas taikai or Christmas uh, party or whatever, yeah, yeah. and um, I would I would do a demonstration. We'd have a, you know, uh, talent, talent Yeah, show. very traditional Japanese um, yeah. uh, parties and, and gatherings, I guess you would say, the taikais, right? right. And then there's, there's singing, there's dancing, there's, That's there's right. kata. That's right. So you got to do it at least. So I got to do a little bit of that. and um, But no, I was not able to, it's interesting, so I wasn't able to train, but I wouldn't say I wasn't, I wouldn't say I lost anything as far as my martial arts training, only because, in, in my opinion, um, understanding karate in Okinawa exists within the Okinawa culture. And so we're in a dojo right now. And when you walk outside, you are still in the in the cultural environment that that this that, that, that is karate, right? And so everything about the Okinawan culture is also reflected in the dojo. And everything you learn in the dojo is reflected once you leave the dojo in Okinawan culture, right? In the United States, I think it's different. Because in the US, you come to a dojo and there you're introduced to things that seem very for, foreign. The idea of walking into the dojo, bowing, going and finding every, every, every um, you know, black yudansha and bowing to them and giving them a proper greeting, you know, konbanwa, konbanwa. The idea of um, uh, the, the respect to teacher, student, respect, I think all that is, that's not a dojo thing in Okinawa, that's a society thing in Okinawa. That is, that is Okinawan society. Yeah. In America, when we go to the dojo, it's almost like we're artificially creating this little microcosm of Okinawan culture, but it's in a very foreign culture uh, than that than what exists in that dojo. Does that make sense? It does. It makes sense to me. I don't know that it makes sense to people that haven't lived here or trained, even in America, trained under an Okinawa sensei or Japanese sensei. It, it's a Correct. hard concept to grasp. It is, because you have to experience you it. You have to experience it. And that's why I say that in two years I spent on my mission, while I was focused on something completely different than karate, um, uh, and in my opinion, more valuable than karate, but, but it, it was not at all a lost period of time for me, because I began to, I mean, I lived in a little Lokujo, six tatami room apartment, um, learned the language, understood the, the basic mindset, the basic how the culture kind of works. And, and now that I'm in Okinawa, um, I have, I, I, you know, you can, you can compare and contrast and see and understand a lot more due to that. And I don't think without that experience, even though I wasn't in the dojo every day, I do think it, it helped my karate overall. The whole, the whole, the sum total of my karate. 
Not my techniques, but maybe my understanding. So after your time in, in, uh, on your mission in Nagoya, right? Nagoya, right, the Nagoya area. Mm -hmm. When you come back to BYU, finish up school there, right. and at some point you made that decision to become a Marine. Yeah, that's right. So I was, um, I had a roommate who was an Army ROTC, great guy. He used to wake up at 4.30 every morning and he'd go and PT. And these Army dudes were out there PTing every morning. And I mean, it was, it, it, you know, these guys were studs. And he talked me into going to go, PT's physical training, right? Yep, yep. into this, of course. But, but so, so he, he, this guy talks me into getting up and going and training with this, this team, this ROTC team. There's all these, all these uh, army, these, these guys who are army ROTC, and they were studs. Like they ran, we, we'd run the army PFT, the P, PT mm -hmm. test, mm -hmm. and uh, I was like the slow guy on the team, nine man, nine man team. I was like the sixth fastest guy in the two mile run. I was running a ten twenty two miles, right? I ain't shabby. I'm not like you know, it's not like I'm a, I'm not collegiate track or anything, yeah. but a ten twenty two miles, that ain't bad. I was a slow guy on the yeah. team. I was bringing up rear end Charlie. These guys were hard to keep up with. And, and they were a great group of guys. And I really felt um, a strong, you know, a fairly sense of, of, of belonging and achievement in, 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 this, in this Army program. But then, of course, they came and said, hey, we'll, we'll throw some scholarship money your way. and You can be an Army officer. Not sure I can be in the army. I love the army. There's some great soldiers in the yeah, army. Yeah. Great officers in the every army. Branch great, great every branch, every great people. But my, you know, and I'm sure this back is the influence of growing was, up. Well, Dad led me back in the house. Yeah, well, there was a little. <laughs> <laughs> there was a little bit of that, and and you know, my parents raised us to be independent thinkers and and to be ourselves, and so I could have done that, but I also, in, in my heart of hearts, knew that the Marine Corps was a place for me to be, yep. and ultimately. Uh, I made the decision to um, commission in the Marine Corps, or try to commission the Marine Corps. And unfortunately, the Marine Corps, you know, selected me to for, for the privilege of, of leading Marines, and, and that's what I've done for the last 26 years. Fantastic! Yeah. And you've been around the world doing that. Yeah, so I'm an infantry officer, and and uh, have have had the opportunity to uh, you know be in infantry units, and and fortunately, because of my Japanese background um, I, and, and some additional education I've gotten. I've, I've had the opportunity with the Marine Corps to do a lot of stuff with, with Japan on a you know, more strategic and operational level, um, in addition to doing all the other, other stuff that, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, other places we normally go. I've had the opportunity to work in Tokyo uh, in the, and, and to work in D.C. with, you know, doing J Japan relations and things like that. So I've been very fortunate to uh, to be able to kind of balance both those worlds throughout throughout my career. Do you think that you would have had some of, some of those same opportunities, specifically with the interactions with the Japanese, had you not gone and, and, and put forth the effort to learn the language and study the language so much? No, because I don't think I'd have applied. I don't think the draw would have been there for me. Um, I think uh, I, I um, you know, I pursued a program that was a very young program at the time in the Marine Corps. That um, it, it creates officers that, that have a bit of a background and expertise in a particular country, a country, or region of the world, region of the world, right? And so I, I um, uh, took the time to, to pursue that, but I'm not sure that I would have done that if I hadn't, you know, lived, done, done, served my mission in Japan. Certainly had the background with uh, with uh, karate, although karate never really. My first time coming to Okinawa was prior to joining the Marine Corps, but I was in college by then, and my, my course was kind of set, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a very good introduction. And uh, I would like to kind of stop it there and tease people, because I think next time I want to get into the Marine Corps, and okay. the training and the sure. connection between that, the mindset, the physical connection, the mental connection, mm -hmm. and some things that we've talked about not sure. what I'm recording and, and tie that in. Uh, but because you've talked about your father a lot, yeah. uh, I, I can't let this go oh. without talking about <laughs> yeah. and, and, and showing people uh, yeah. your father. So just a quick plug here. Uh, I appreciate it. Who's this guy here? 
Jason, Jason. S.T. Perry yeah, author. Oh right. my gosh. Yeah, so you know, a few years ago, I, I got this crazy idea that, um, uh, yeah, you know, Dad's 83 years old. He's no spring chicken. I mean, he still gets around, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to square up with him today, but uh, or square off with him today. But um, you know, he's getting up there in years, and and you know, frankly, he's had a lot of influence. I think, I think, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, I, I started to realize the influence Dad had. And he doesn't talk about it a lot, but if you get out and start talking to people, you know, Dad's name just kind of pops up uh, on, in fairly regularly, and. And in corners that I, there's certain communities that I would expect Dad's name to come up, but then his name was coming up in places that I, I kind of didn't expect. And, and I started thinking, you know, I need to write this stuff down. I'd, I'd, I'd be, I'd, I'd really regret it if I didn't write these things down and, and record my experiences with, with Dad. Yep. And the book's called An Old Man's Way because I also look at the, all of dad's students and I'm probably the only one that's known him since he was in his thirties all the way until he was, you know, all the way into his eighties. I've been a student for 50 years and, um, oh, 47 years, I guess, I don't know, whatever it is, you know, but, um, so, you know, I saw the young man's way. I saw the middle-aged man's way and now I see the old man's way. And I think we all have to experience our own old young man's way. We all have to experience it. And so I wanted to record that because I wanted the those people that have only been exposed to, to old man Perry, right? Perry Sensei, yeah. the old man. And be able to see that with Perry Sensei, the young man, who um, was human, right? Um, probably did some things in karate that, that are not the reason he does karate now. You know, and and to see that we talk about Shu Ha Li, we yes. talked about that earlier. Yes. You know, but to see that that maturation process that we all need to go through, and um, and which means that you know all of us need to get in the dojo and bang it out a little bit, and get bloodied up a little bit. We all need to learn that that's not what karate is all about. Um, we all need to do kata until we're about to you know pass out and, and understand why. Karate is the way it is. Why kata is karate. Yep. Um, we all then need to learn um, how how this applies to us in our old age. And, and I look in Okinawa and in this society out here and you wonder why they live so long. They live so long, I think, because they have a sense of community, because they have a sense of belonging, because they stay active, because they eat well. They have, you know, there's a, there's a, a sense of belonging there. And I think um, in a lot of people's the dojo becomes that, yep. the family Absolutely becomes does. that. And so I wanted to record that. So this took me like six years to write. <laughs> the book, An Old Man's Way, Doug Perry's Unlikely Journey Through Karate, War, and Life. And we're going to save this one for another episode as well. I read the book a year ago, I guess. Yeah, I think it was, it was uh, last year I read it. And um, we're going to talk about it in depth. Yeah, in another episode, it. Sure. It, it it pulled me in a lot, uh, it's and it's weird. it's not it's not only about about martial arts. There's some <laughs> there's some funny things in the book. There's some <laughs> there's some eye opening things in the book. Um, but one thing I want to say about your father, because you you had recognized that his name would come up in different circles, right? Uh, and I, I started with Sensei Cotham back in. Mm -hmm. in in North Carolina, right. um, so he's he's in Greensboro area. Yes. I was living out closer to Raleigh, um, but one time I was going on a business trip down to Georgia, and I was going to be outside of Atlanta, yeah. maybe Alpharetta or something like that. I can't remember exactly where I was, mm -hmm. and I was going to be down there for about a week, and I think it was a, a, a Monday through Friday class, so I was going to drive down um, and get in there on Sunday and come back. Saturday or something, so I was like, well, maybe I can find a dojo in the area, right? So I did. I found a, a, another Shodan Ryu dojo. Okay. And I had asked Sensei Confident about it, and I didn't even get the question all the way out of my mouth. And uh, <laughs> he scolded me the way he does. Yeah. You know, very fruitful and, sure. you know, vocabulary. Uh -huh. And But what he said was, uh, 
the the only short interview people you need to train with and visit would be Mr. Perry. Because that's, the, you know, basically, and I'm being polite the way I'm saying yeah, it, you know, sure. everybody else is, you know, the way Sensei Coffin yeah. talks, right? But that was it. And, and Mr., you know, that's that's when Sensei Coffin respects someone when he uses the, the Mr., you know. So I was like, okay. And I yeah. and other students uh, in the dojo have spoken very highly of your father uh, in the dojo and on the dance floor. But again, we'll, we'll get yeah, into those. Yeah, there's a little bit of dancing in there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, those are, those are all fun stories. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that too. But those, those, those Marines get together. You know, Vic Coffin was a Marine and, and new dad. And I, I mentioned Larry Isaac and Ace, Hayes Sensei and all those, all those folks. You know, there's a, there's a brotherhood in arms there that, that you understand. And then, of course, uh, many of these guys, they're, they're really pioneers. They, yeah. they, they, they forged their way into karate. The, the karate they, they learned, they didn't, it wasn't as accessible. And so um, I think that, that that love of the art brought them together in, in ways that, uh, and so they still greatly respect, uh, all of them respect each other very, they're very much. I, mean, I was a young kid when I met Hayes, or uh, Coffin Sensei, and you know, watching him fight in tournaments and stuff, and you know, he's like, wow, you stand in all of those. Yeah. Stuff, guys, so. yeah. yeah. All right. Stories for another To day. be continued. Yes. <laughs> Sir, thank, thank you so much. I really fun. appreciate it. Oh my it. goodness, we were two hours. I feel like it feels a little bit self-centered, self-serving, but uh, but it's not. Yeah. It's not. I mean, it's a story. And yeah. I, I understand. I understand. But uh, yeah. I, you know, I appreciate it. But, uh, and we appreciate you. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Okinawa Karate Podcast. I am Josh Summers coming from the Birthplace of Karate, Okinawa, Japan.